All righty, guys, let's get into the text. We're going to be in Psalm 142 today. <clears throat> Psalm 142. And before we start, um, let me pray. Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you, God, for who you are. Oh, God, we admit that we are such needy, needy people. We need you so much, God. Um, Lord, I pray that you may be magnified through our lives, that you may speak to us, Father, through your word. God, that you may make us, uh, conform us to, to Christ. Help us to be more like Christ as each day goes by, Father. And I pray, God, that you may get me out of the way, Lord. Um, I need you, Father. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. So, Psalm 142, uh, we're going to go over the background of Psalm 142, and it, it starts in, actually, it's in the book of Samuel. So, 1 Samuel chapter 18, starting in verse 5. 1 Samuel 18, starting in verse 5. <clears throat> it says this, so this is after uh, he... Uh, killed Goliath, and now he's part of the army of Israel. Verse 5 says, So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered, and Saul set him over the men of war, and it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. It happened as they were coming when David returned from killing the Philistine that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. The women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then Saul became very angry, for this saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. Now it came about on the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul, and he raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand as usual. And a spear was in Saul's hand. Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped from his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with him, and, but had departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and appointed him as his commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. David was prospering in all his ways, for the Lord was with him. When Saul saw that he was prospering greatly, he dreaded him. In verse 16, but all Israel and Judah loved David, and he went out and came in before them. So, in verse 5, we see that David was prospering wherever Saul sent him. In verse 14, we read again, David was prospering in all his ways, for the Lord was with him. And in verse 16, it says, all, all Israel and Judah loved David, and he went out and came in before them. So I point those verses out because... To show that David was actually doing an awesome job. He was prospering greatly. He was leading an army. It actually says, if you continue reading uh, 18 through like 22, you'll see that he was wiser than, than all of them. He was actually doing an awesome job. He was doing what is right. He was trying to be faithful to God and faithful to Saul. And everyone loved him. But then something happened. And there was a song that was sang by the women of Israel when, they had, when David and Saul came from killing the Philistines, and this is a song that changed everything for David. And in verse 7, the song goes like this, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Because of this song, Saul became very angry. In verse 9 uh, through 12, we see that Saul starts looking at David with suspicion. Saul tries to kill David, and Saul is afraid of David, for the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. From then on, Saul starts to persecute David and tries to kill him in various ways. In chapter 19, Jonathan warns David of his father, Saul, trying to kill him, so David starts fleeing. And in chapter 21, David gets Goliath's sword and flees that day from Saul and tries to find refuge with Achish, the king of Gath. So because of that song, everything changed for David. Now he's trying to find refuge with King Achish. And he's, he's in front of him, but then something happens. The servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? There's that song again. So because of that, actually, David 
he starts to fear greatly and starts acting crazy in front of King Achish, causing King Achish to tell his servants to get David out of his face. They're like, this guy's a madman. Look at him. He actually started acting like he's drooling because he heard that he got afraid. And this leads David to depart from there and escape to the cave of Adullam, where he stays alone, abandoned, with no one with him. So remember, David was prospering. He was being successful. He was trying to be faithful to God and faithful to Saul. And then, because of that song, he lost everything. And, you know, just imagine having the friends he had, the people praising him. And then now he's alone in a cave, abandoned by all. No one with him. So this leads us to Psalm 142, where he wrote this psalm. And I have titled this message, God is Our Refuge. That is uh, the point that I, I, I want to bring across to us today, that God is our refuge. So let's read Psalm 142. Verse 1 says, I cry aloud with my voice to the Lord. I make supplication with my voice to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my trouble before him. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path. In the way where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, for there is no one who regards me. There is no escape for me. No one cares for my soul. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring my soul out of prison so that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. So starting in verse 1 and 2, we see the cry of David. David starts crying out to God. Right off the back, we see his childlike faith. Like a child cries for his daddy's help, so David cries for his Abba. To help him. And he's not just whispering, he's crying aloud. He's loudly uh, crying out to God. So just imagine how this would have sounded in the cave he was in. All the echoes while he was crying out alone. Just imagine how that that would, man, he's just screaming, crying out, just like, Lord, help me. And who is he crying out to? He's crying out to the Lord. He makes supplication to the Lord. He pours out his complaint before the Lord. He declares his trouble before the Lord. David couldn't find refuge anywhere he went until he goes into a cave and finds refuge in God. So when all abandon you, God is your refuge. You cannot find refuge in man. Man will fail you, but God will never fail you. So when you feel alone, when you feel abandoned, the first one you should always cry out to is the Lord. He's the first one that we all should go to. God listens to the cry of his people. And if you truly are his child, he will hear you. And when you do cry out, pour out your complaint, declare your trouble before him. Be honest with God. Don't act like everything is okay when it's not. God knows what you are going through. He knows everything. So don't be afraid or ashamed or think that it's a sign of weakness to pour it all out. Some of you are too strong to cry out like this, or too prideful to do so. Don't let your pride get in the way. Recognize that you are weak and that you need God to be your refuge. David declares his trouble, his problem or difficult circumstance to God. He actually is open. He's honest. He's saying, God, look, this is what I'm going through. And that's what we got to do. We can't hide stuff. We can't act like God doesn't know. And not only that, that just shows us that We ought to expect trouble, problems, and difficulty in life. Just in case you did not know, you are going to go through difficulties in life. You are going to run across problems. The question is, how will you deal with them? Will you take refuge in man or drugs, alcohol? Will you take refuge in TV or even sleep to try to just not go through the day and just sleep? Or will you take refuge in God? What or who will you take refuge in? So when trouble arises, we must take refuge in God. God is our refuge. And in verse 3, we see David overwhelmed with the trials. 
He says, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path. So have you ever felt overwhelmed internally? So overwhelmed that you just feel like giving up or even dying. Proverbs 18, 14 says this, The spirit of a man can endure his sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? So when you, when you are extremely sick, but you're walking faithfully with the Lord, you can actually endure your sickness. You can walk in the joy of the Lord, and you can even praise God while you're sick. But you can be the healthiest man in the world, and if your spirit is broken, you will not be able to endure it. The spirit of a man can endure his sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? And this is how David felt. But David wasn't only going through internal trials. He was also going through external trials. King Saul was persecuting him. And he wanted his head. He was sending his whole army after David. And David is suffering for doing what is right. He's actually being faithful. So many of us suffer for doing what is wrong. And when we do, we try to blame God and say, why am I going through this, God? When you actually brought it upon yourself. So when you sin and because of your sin bring difficulty to your life, don't blame God. Please don't blame God. Like we, we do, I've done it, we, we do it, but we should not do that. We can't blame God for our, for our sin and then say that he did it. Instead, we should repent. We should repent of our sin, come to God. But David is actually suffering for doing what is right. And there will be times in your walk with God that you will suffer for doing what is right, for being faithful. And Satan hates faithful Christians. And just like Saul sent his whole army to take down this faithful man of God, so Satan will send his army to take down the faithful men and women of God. So if you desire to be faithful to God, just realize that Satan will come after your head. There was actually a man... His name was John the Baptist, and at the end of his life, his head was literally on a platter. He was a faithful, faithful man of God. So like Saul wanted David's head, Satan wants your head, our head. We become a target. When you become a believer, you become a target by the kingdom of darkness. So are you sure you want to follow God? Are you willing to suffer for Christ? Have you counted the cost of what it means to be a disciple of Christ? Are you willing to have Satan and his army after your head? Are you willing to pick up your cross daily and follow Jesus? If so, then expect persecutions, trials, and suffering. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 16 and 19. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fire ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Why? And then it says, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. If people are actually mocking you for the name of Jesus, you're blessed. And why does Peter say that? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. In other words, it's a sign. It shows that you truly are saved, that you have the spirit of the living God living inside of you. So Peter says, rejoice when you're going through these trials. That means God is with you, that God is in you, that you are saved, that you're a born-again believer. Then he says, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. So don't suffer for doing what is wrong. But if you suffer for for Christ, don't be ashamed. Paul says in Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. We need to stop being ashamed of Christ. A lot of us you know, who claim to be Christian, we're ashamed to talk about Jesus in our jobs, in our place, wherever we go. We cannot be ashamed of Christ. Verse 19 says this, Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Suffer according to the will of God 
You know, it was not granted only for you to believe in God, but to suffer for his namesake. We are going to suffer for Christ. But what does he say to do? It's actually God's will for us to suffer, to make us more like Christ, to test us. Just like the gold needs to be passed through the fire to to get rid of all the impurities. So we got to go through trials and actually makes us stronger, makes us more like Christ to get rid of all the impurities. And we got to keep entrusting our souls to a faithful creator and doing what is right. You got to keep trusting God. He is faithful and he knows what he's doing. Then in, chapters, in chapter 5, verse 8 through 10, he says, Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. By the way, what does Satan devour? John Piper says he eats, uh, Satan eats faith, our faith for, for breakfast. That's what he wants to eat. He wants to eat your faith. He wants to devour your trust in God. He wants to cause you to stumble so you can stop focusing on God. But resist him, firm in your faith. In other words, don't let him have your faith. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. You are not alone in this. There are brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering far more than us in other countries. There are families literally being taken away, their, their heads being chopped off. And, and even brothers here in, you know, in, in America, we're, that we're all suffering. We're all going through this together, but we do it with joy because we know whom we have come to believe in. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So ultimately, God allows us to go through the trials as he did with David. He actually was the one that sent the evil spirit to Saul and caused the persecution on David's life, which is interesting. In verse 3, he says, this is what David says, you knew my path. God knows what you are going through. He knows your path. He knows your problems. He knows your pain. And like Peter said, you must entrust your soul to a faithful creator in doing what is right. In other words, don't give up. Keep standing firm. Keep fighting the good fight. It is a good fight. I know it's tough and I know it's hard, but we have to keep on fighting. We can't give up. We, we need to keep on entrusting our souls to a faithful creator and doing what is right. So you must take refuge in God. He goes on in verse 3. In the way where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, for there is no one who regards me. There is no escape for me. No one cares for my soul. So David's enemies have set traps for him to stumble and fall. His friends that he fought alongside of have left him. He feels trapped as if there is no escape, nowhere to run, and he feels like no one cares for his soul. He feels abandoned by all. And there will come a point in your life where you will feel as if no one cares for you or no one understands what you are going through. You will feel alone, abandoned by all. The question is, was that true in David's life? And I would say no. Like I said, I would say he's going through an internal trial. And I say no because there was people that actually cared for him. Jonathan loved David as he loved his own life. You see the chapters before he actually left, he had a, him and Jonathan were actually weeping together for what was going on. Jonathan and David had an awesome relationship. Jonathan loved David so much, he was willing to give everything to David. He was willing to give him his sword. There's only two swords in Israel, Saul's and Jonathan. And Jonathan said, you can have my armor, you can have my sword, you can have it all. He, Jonathan was supposed to be the, the heir to the throne. And he says, Let's God, let God's will be done. Let David take the throne. He was willing to just give everything up for David. So there was a, someone in Israel that cared for David. Samuel also loved David. There was a time David uh, saw Samuel said, Far be it from me that I sin by ceasing to pray for you. So obviously Samuel was praying for God. He was the one that anointed him as king. And also when his brothers and his father's household Household heard that David was in the cave. They went to him. In 1 Samuel 20, chapter 22, verse 1 and 2, it says this. So David departed from there. After being in front of King Achish, acting like a, a, like a madman, he departs from there and escapes to the cave of Adullam, which is where he wrote Psalm 142. And when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. Everyone who was in distress 
and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, and he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. I say all that to say that David was going through an internal trial. His spirit was broken. He felt alone and abandoned, but he wasn't. He felt like no one cared for him, but that wasn't true. God never left him. He was never alone. God was with him all the time. So when you feel alone or abandoned, just know that there is brothers and sisters that care about you and love you. And most importantly, God cares about you and loves you, and he will never abandon you. So you're not alone. So what should be our response when we feel overwhelmed and alone? We see this in verse 5 through 7. He says, I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring my soul out of prison so that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. David's response in verse 5 was to cry out to God and acknowledge that God is his refuge and God is his portion in the land of the living. Though he has nothing, he has God, and if he has God, he has everything. God is our refuge. When the difficulties come, when the storms come, and the dangers, all the dangers come, we must rest in God. We must take refuge in him. Psalm 46 verse 1 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 61 verse 3 says, For you have been a refuge for me, a tower of strength against the enemy. Just imagine a tower of strength, the whole enemy coming, and you're hidden in God. Even if Satan and his whole demonic forces come and attack you, if you're hidden in God, what can cross through God? There's nothing. He's so powerful. Like, God just laughs when people think that they can actually overcome him. Psalm 2 says that. Psalm 91 verse 2 says this, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortune, my God in whom I trust. In our great example, the Lord Jesus Christ also in John 16 verse 32, he says this, talking to his disciples, he says, Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. So Jesus knows what it means to be abandoned alone by the closest friends that he had, the people he had, he, they all left him. Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. I don't know about you guys, but just knowing that Jesus himself has gone through it brings a lot of comfort. And though Jesus was abandoned by all, he knew that he wasn't alone. He says, after he says, and you guys are going to leave me alone, he says, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. So we have to come to that point where we realize that the Father is with us. You are not alone and you, are not, you have not been abandoned. God is our refuge and our shelter. And David came to that point, and in verse 6, he again starts begging God to listen to his cry And he says, deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Another thing we have to do is recognize our weakness. David recognizes his weakness. He knows that the enemy is too strong for him. And if God does not sustain him, he will fall. So we too must realize that we are weak. Many Many of us here do not know what we are up against. If you think you can stand without God, you're dead wrong. If you think you can stand without the body of Christ, the people of God, you're wrong. We need each other. You will be, if, you think, if you try to do this alone, you're going to be crushed by Satan. Satan is a powerful enemy. He is constantly attacking the children of God. And if you're not on the alert, you will be crushed and he will have your head. But we can overcome if we recognize our weakness and take refuge in God, like David did. So there is hope. We can overcome the attacks of the enemy. Verse 7 says this, Bring my soul out of prison so that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. And the last thing I want to point out in this verse is 
Faith. David has faith. To truly believe that he will get you through this. That he will answer you and deliver you from the enemy, from temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. So God knows how much you can handle and he will not allow you to handle anything that you can't. And David knows this, so he says at the end of verse 7, you will deal bountifully with me. He knows that God can deliver him. He says, you will deal bountifully. And that's faith. He's trusting in God. He's taking refuge in him. But how does one take refuge in God? So I know I've been talking a lot about, you know, you must take refuge in God. You must take refuge in God. And um, we need to know how to do that, right? So this is what I believe is the answer. Who are the ones that are taking refuge in God? It is those who have repented of their sins that have put their faith in Jesus Christ. So the very first thing one must do to take refuge in God is repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. So if you have not done that, if you are living a life without Christ, you are not taking refuge in God. And the very first thing you got to do, the very first step is you must repent of your sins. Acknowledge that you have sinned against a holy God and that you deserve the wrath of God. And you must repent of your sin and put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus died for our sins. He came. He lived the perfect life. He rose again the third day. And right now, Jesus is alive. He's at the right hand of God, commanding all men everywhere to repent. He says, come, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Jesus is calling out to men. So if you have not done that, very first step, you must repent and put your faith in Jesus. Or else... That's the only way we can escape the wrath of God, by taking refuge in Christ, by abiding in him. Or else you're going to have to be able, you have to be strong enough to withstand the wrath of God by your own strength. And there's no one, no one that can do that. So run to Jesus. And for us, um, for the ones that have done that first step, how do we continue to take refuge in God? And this actually is an article from Desiring God. I thought it was pretty cool from John Piper and them. They wrote this, on the one hand, then, taking refuge in God means hiding in Jesus. That's the first step, right? The rock. But taking refuge in God also goes a step further. It means living a life of holiness in this chaotic world, completely devoted to God. In Christ, God's people really can perform the righteous deeds that God loves, even when the foundations are destroyed and troubles surround us. So by the Holy Spirit, we can actually overcome, we can actually do the righteous requirements that God has called us to do because greater is he who lives in us than he who is in the world. So by the Spirit of God, we can actually continue to grow in Christ's likeness. And when we're walking by the Spirit, we're actually acknowledging and trusting that what God is saying is true and we're having faith in that. And that's an act of taking refuge in God. He goes on and says, may we celebrate Sunday as a day of refuge in God instead of in self-reliance. We're here together acknowledging that we have, uh, we've taken refuge in God and we're come worshiping God because of who he is, because we abide in Christ instead of in self-reliance. As we enter God's presence with other believers, let's reflect that God sees and tests the righteous and let's give thanks that when God is our refuge, he both redeems us from our sin and equips us to display righteous deeds. May our worship always reflect how beautiful and awesome God is and how much we need his mercy and grace in Christ. We need him every day of our lives. So as sons and daughters of Christ, we can truly say God is our refuge. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, God, for saving us. Lord, by your grace, we are who we are. We don't deserve your amazing love. We don't deserve any of it, Lord. We don't even deserve to be sitting on these chairs or standing up here on this place today, God. But you have 
bestowed your grace upon us through the Lord Jesus Christ. That unmerited favor. We don't deserve your favor, but you said that you want to give it to us because you're a gracious, merciful, loving God. And we thank you, God, for becoming our refuge, for calling us, Father, for saving us by the power of your Spirit. Thank you, Lord. We are eternally grateful. We are thankful, God, for everything, Lord. Please help us, Father. Please help us, Lord, here. Help us acknowledge how weak we are, how much we need you, Lord. Help us remember that we are not alone, that you are with us. And may we draw near to you by drawing near to your word and prayer and the body of Christ, those brothers and sisters who love and care for us. Oh, Lord, help us remember that we are not alone and that you are a refuge. In Jesus' name, amen. Feel, uh, feel free to take communion. Um, it's a time where we acknowledge that, you know, God has forgiven us and we confess our sins. And so, thank you guys. <laughs>